Let's say you're planning for a vacation. Now imagine you've dumped all the stuff in one luggage without organizing them. And imagine taking along with you the stuff that you don't really need, like an oven, toaster, mattress, etc. Well, life was something like that before the introduction of Java packages and JPMS. In this chapter, we'll look at packages, access specifiers, the Java platform module system, and a lot more. All right, in this chapter, we're gonna talk about packages. And especially in this video, we're gonna talk about how to use packages, how to import them, etc. Take a look at this folder. We have multiple files in here. Some of these files are related to music and some of these files are related to cooking and we got few other random files. Now the problem with this is everything in here looks very tedious. These files are not organized. Also, if you wanted to create another file with the same name, say some name, it's not possible to have two files with the same name in the same folder. So what is the solution? How do we make things look a lot cleaner, more organized? is by creating folders. So let's do that. I'm going to right click and create a folder. I'm going to name it as music, music, and uh, files that are related to music will go inside that directory, which is favorite artist list and songs list. These two files will go in here. And now we can have another directory say cooking and then we're going to move these two files in here another directory with say random or whatever we're going to move everything in here now if you wanted to create another file with the same name say apple you can't create in the same directory but you can always create in another directory that's very obvious right but let's see how we can similar behavior in our Java project using packages. Let's go to our project. Now actually I have created this video long ago and after I finished recording all the core Java videos and when I'm trying to edit, I found out that this video which talks about packages is corrupt. So I have to remake this video. So you may see a slight mismatch between this video and the next video. I'll try to keep it smooth but you may see a slight mismatch. So let me just get rid of the folders which I have created in here or the packages that I've created and I'll try to explain it again. Let me get rid of these two. I'm going to say delete. Yes. Now what I'm going to do is create a new package and see what it is. I'm going to right click on the project, say new and say Java package. I'm going to name it as new package. I want to leave the name as it is. Click finish. The moment you create a package, if you go into the project directory, you can get the path of the project by right clicking on the project, click on properties, and here you get the path. Let's go there. And once you go there and click on directory named SRC stands for source, you're going to see that package in here. Essentially, it is represented as a folder in Windows or directory in Linux. Same way, if you create a folder in here with uh, say, some name, oh, it's already there so we can't have the same name. I'm going to call it uh, some other name. And that way, if you go here, you see it created here. You can do it either way. You can, either you can create a package and see a folder there or you can create a folder there and see a package here. Now let's try to create a class inside that folder or a package. So you're gonna right click on that package and say Java class. I'm gonna leave the name as new class or you can give your own name, whatever. Finish. And once you do so, when we auto-generate the class, you have seen we got all these unnecessary comments which we can get rid of but the key thing is you can see 
this particular statement would say is package new package which means this class is actually residing in a package named new package. If you try to give a different name or the name of a different package that's going to throw an error. For example we can't give the package name which we have just created uh, let's say some other name some other name that doesn't work you get a compile time error. So now uh, just as we have seen that we're able to keep things keep files organized uh, we can also achieve the same thing in here. Now we can also create a class file with the same name new class on a different package. Let's say copy and you can paste it over here. Uh, refactor copy or just copy. Refactor copy would let you make changes to the name or whatever. So now let's click this but obviously you get an error because we're not supposed to give the package name as new package which is the package name of this. This is supposed to be some other name. Now things work pretty well. So that's the beauty of packages. It will help you keep things or classes in more organized fashion. You can keep related class files in a certain package. Now let's say in here what you wanted to do is you wanted to use class files which are residing in another package. How do we achieve that? Let's say I wanted to use class called this some name dot java which is residing in some name package. I want to use it in my class. So if I try to create an object of some name it just doesn't work. New some name it throws an error. What you can do is you need to import this particular class into your project or into your package. What you need to do is you need to import this class into your class file. How do you do that? You're going to use a keyword called import and then you're going to specify the package name basically the package wherever your uh, desired class file is residing. So it's going to be some name dot and you already got suggestions. You can just use arrow keys and select that class file that you wanted to use. And now we should no longer be having this error but still we have. That's because uh, we don't have the name correct. It has to be lowercase s. We already know that Java is super case sensitive and it gets annoying at times like we've seen just now. So let me just get rid of this once and make sure we see an error. Let's save the file. You got an error. Let's undo. Get rid of that error. Now you can call all the methods inside this class without any problem and I don't think I need to do that. So that's how packages will work. Also say that you wanted to use all these classes residing in the package some name then you don't have to import each and every class you can just import the entire package like so you can use star character and that would let you use any or all the classes inside the some name package All right, that's it on packages. It's very simple and easy. Now you may ask me, if these are packages, then what are these? These are all just logical entities created by your IDE, like NetBeans or Eclipse does the same thing. It is just for our convenience. These are not actual folders. If you go into the project directory, you won't see those folders. This logical entity called source packages will actually have source files and this logical entity test packages will have 
the test files. Now you probably don't know what a test file is. Uh, you will get to know when you when we talk about JUnit or Mockito, etc. So that's going to be a different uh, chapter altogether, or rather, different course altogether. So at least for Core Java, you're not really bothered about this this logical entity called test packages. What you should be concerned about is the source packages, libraries, and test libraries. Again, you don't need test libraries. Uh, libraries are just all the libraries that you're using in this particular project, packages. So you're using all the JDK libraries, which is a default library, or you could import some external libraries to use them in your project. We'll talk about them pretty soon. So these are not actually residing in this directory packages. This is just a logical uh, or these are just logical entities created by the IDE for your convenience. All right, uh, see you in my next video. Okay, in this video, we're going to talk about access restriction or access specifiers in Java. Let's assume you have a robot. Now, I have to admit that this is not the best diagram, but this is the best I can do. The robot looks more like a robot which is yelling. Uh, but I suggest you to ignore the quality of this diagram and stay focused on the topic. So let's assume that you own this robot and it's just robot without any intelligence in it. You'll have to write your own source code so that the robot will perform a certain task. Let's say you wanted robot to perform the task of getting the pizza from the nearest store. Of course, it's beyond the current technology. We don't have our artificial intelligence technology developed to an extent where a robot will physically move to a physical store and get you pizza. But let's assume so for the sake of example. But at the same time, you don't have knowledge on programming. You do have knowledge, but it's very limited. You can only give the basic instructions to the robot, but you cannot write the entire program to perform your task. So what you're going to do is you're going to purchase the code from outside, from a different company, and you're going to use that code. Let's say I'm the guy who is providing you that code where it will have a lots of tasks. Basically, it's just a class file called robot, and it will have lots of methods like walk or run get pizza ignore the handwriting and lot of other tasks each one of these methods will perform a certain task for example the method walk will have instructions that will instruct the robot to walk same as with the run same as with get pizza now you purchase the code from me and then you create an object of this class and then you'll try to use all these methods. Now do take a note that I'm not going to give you the source code. What I would do is I will compile my class and I'll give you the class file. So you don't have visibility on the source code. You can only use my code but you cannot edit it. Now in your robot class you're going to create public static void main, the main method. And then inside that, you're going to make use of all the methods, whichever is required. So in order to perform your task of getting pizza from the nearest store, you're going to use the method called walk. And you're going to use the method called maybe get into the car. Okay. Let me list down here. Walk. Get in. To the car and start the car etc these are all methods which are residing on my class similarly you keep instructing the robot to perform the task of getting the pizza now there's a problem here you could go wrong with the sequence for example if you put walk in the end then 
the robot will not even approach the car and so it cannot get the pizza. So there's a possibility of messing things up. So what I do to solve you that problem, I'm not going to expose all the methods which are, which are not really required. For example, walk, run, get into the car. These are all methods I don't want anybody to access. What I want people to access, people like you to access is the method like get pizza. And all these methods, I'm just going to use them internally. If I don't want you to use these methods, then I'm just going to mark them as private so that your source code does not have any visibility of these methods. And for the methods like get pizza, I'm going to make them public. That means this, this method is available for you to use. This is not any security measure. This is for the convenience. This is to provide you the convenience so that you don't mess up with the logic. So now by doing this, you don't, you don't write this because you cannot, for example, you cannot access the walk method or get into the car, etc. All you can do is to access the public methods, which in this case, get pizza. So that way I'm sure that whoever is using, purchasing and using my code will not mess up with the logic. I hope I made myself clear. So now the question arises, which method to mark as public and which method to mark as private? For all the methods which has the scope of changing over a period of time, you want to make that method private. For example, let's say we have this method, get, get inside the car. My current logic is allowing the robot to get inside any car that it sees. This is clearly inappropriate because we don't want robot to get inside somebody else's car. We want robot to get inside our own car. So now I have decided to make changes to this method by adding additional arguments to this method, like which car to get in, the number of the car, and the location of the car. The user will send the parameters. But we have a problem. If I make this method as public, then you will have an error because you're using this method without sending the arguments. But now you will have to send parameters. So because of my change in the code, you will end up having an error in your code. And there are hundreds of people who are using my code like you are. And that's going to cause a lot of problem. And in fact, it's going to destroy my reputation as a company. So I will not make this method as public. I would make it as private. So that I'm pretty well aware that nobody can, can access this method. So I'm free to make changes to the arguments or with the logic. And whichever method is public, you should not make any changes to the signature of the method or the logic inside. You can make changes of the logic inside that method, public method, but no drastic changes because we know that these methods are being used by hundreds of people out there. Hope that makes sense. So basically, to, to get the definition of an access specifier or access restriction, the keywords like private, public, and there are a couple of other keywords are actually used to restrict the visibility of member variables, member functions or methods, and even constructors. We'll talk about access restriction on constructors in our next video. In this video, let's take a look at a few examples of access uh, specifiers in our Java code. Let's go to our workbench. But before that, let me just mention that we have four different types of access specifiers. Public, private, protected, and default. Default in itself is not an access specifier. It's not an official access specifier. When you don't specify any of these to a method, field, or a constructor, then by default, 
default access specifier will be considered. So we'll see what all this in our examples. Let's go to our workbench. I'm in the workbench. Let's expand this project. We have a class called packages from our previous example. And the class sum name. Now if I make this, okay, the method in here, the current existing method is marked as public. If a method or field or a constructor is marked as public, that means that method is accessible within this package as well as in other packages. If I don't specify any access specifier, then that means it's a, it's a default access specifier. And the default access specifier means the method is accessible only within that package. Now we got an error here for obvious reasons because this method belongs to a different package and the access specifier is default. And we got an error that it cannot access the method. So we need to make this public. Let's try to create another class inside the same package. Let's copy the file and paste it. Let's do refactor copy. Give it some name one, whatever. Inside this, what I would like to do is try to create an object, basically the same steps what we have followed here. Let's copy that and paste it over here. Let's save the file. All right, actually, we're going to need the public static void main because this has to be inside a method. Let's copy that as well. Copy and paste it. We didn't have any error in here. That's because this is a default access specifier and is accessible within the package. Let's make it private. Now private meaning this method is accessible only within this particular class. So we get an error here, very obvious. Let's, so we, we've understood what is private, public, and default access specifier. Protected is something that we're gonna cover at later point of time. Once we understand the concept of inheritance, uh, for now this will do. But now let's just take a look at, okay, let's put the default one or the public one public access specifier, save the file. Now let's take a look at the access restriction for member fields or variables. Same as methods, if I make this as private, let's save the file. Nobody outside this class will be able to access this particular variable. Let me prove it right away. So object dot we just got the variable y but x is missing because we have it marked as private and if you don't specify anything that's default so it shouldn't be accessible outside the package so let's try to access So none of those two variables are accessible. If we make this public, let's save the file. And now we should get the variable x in the suggestion. That means it is accessible. Let's, un let's undo those changes. Save the file. Let's get rid of this, save the file. And that's it. 
Now we've understood the usage of access specifiers for methods. Now let's try to understand the real advantage of access specifiers on the variables. There are two good reasons why you want to use access specifiers on variables. One, if you want to restrict the users of your class to not update the value that the variable is holding. At the same time, you want them to read the value. Let me show you what I mean. Let me save your time by writing the code and I'll get back. But maybe I'll show you something. Go to source and then click on insert code. Click on getters and setters. Choose these two variables in here and click generate. So basically these methods are to do perform to perform read and write operations on these variables get x meaning we're just returning the value of x and set x meaning we're writing something to this variable so from outside this class we may not be able to write or update the value directly but we can update the value using the set method set x method because this is public and this is private save the file control s now let's say we don't want any write operations to happen so we just we're, we're just going to simply get rid of all these set methods in here and save the file now guess what you can only read these values using these methods but you cannot do any updates on these variables if you want to see the example object dot those variables are not directly accessible, but you can know the value from these getx and gety methods. Right. So that is one advantage. The other advantage is let's do control Z. We have the setx method here. And let's say you only want to store a value which is of multiples of 10 so we cannot just let any value to be stored in here for example if user enters 10 then we're going to straight away store the value of x to 10 if it is 100 since it's multiples of 10 we're going to store it if it is say 97 then we're going to update the value maybe a default value to 10 if this is a dog class then if the variable x is is to mention the height of a dog then user can't just enter uh, 10 feet or 100 feet because that would never be the height of a dog if the user enters an inappropriate value will store the default value so we can have the logic in here if x 10 equals 0 if the reminder of x when we divide it by 10 is 0 then yes we want to store the value else this dot x we want to give some default value which would be say 10 let's save the file or better yet, let's make it zero. Now, from outside the class, I want to do write operation object dot set x. I'll do hundred system dot out dot print ln object dot get the value of x go to the end and do it let's save the file and try to run the program great we got we got 50 and 100 not sure where's this uh, 50 is coming from all right uh, i guess we are printing it somewhere in here 
okay we got method I guess well yes we're calling it over here um, we'll let that be there now let's try to give a value of 99 or 97 that is not divisible by 10 and this should give us zero there you go it's zero so it's sort of letting us restrict or letting us feed the right value into the fields now i want to point out something in our whiteboard diagram let's go there now this brings me to talk about one of the greatest one of the greatest features of object oriented programming language is encapsulation encapsulation means hiding the inner details and exposing only the essential details is called encapsulation to give you a real-time example take an example of a car as a car user you don't need to know how the engine works etc you just need to know how to use the brake how to control the steering how to change the gears etc all the details like engine and all the technical details will be hidden from you so that's sort of like the manufacturer hides all those internal details and will expose only the details that are required for you to perform your task and that's exactly what we're doing here by marking a lot of methods as private we're hiding them we're hiding them from the users and we're only exposing the essential details the public methods and that's called encapsulation in Java we'll talk about more object-oriented features as we come across with those examples so pretty soon you will be an expert in java trust me in our next video we're going to talk about access restriction for constructors In this video, we're going to talk about access restriction for constructors. Now, in this class, AR constructors stands for access restriction constructors. We have everything static. We have static methods, and whatever we're going to use inside the static method are going to be static as well. So we have our variables as static. Now a question for you does it make sense to create an object of this class when you don't have any methods or variables that you can access with that object what is the purpose of creating the object there is no purpose and we're trying to do the same thing in here so we don't want users to create objects of my class or constructors to save their memory so what I'm going to do I'm going to create a constructor so that will overwrite the default constructor control C and control V and that's it this is a default empty constructor still will be able to access but if you make this as private then guess what we cannot create an object we cannot instantiate a class we get an error that's because this constructor in here is only accessible within this class and is not visible outside this class as simple as that we're saving memory so this is one purpose why you want to use a private constructor okay let's do control Z and save the file we have another usage of private constructors if you want to follow a singleton design pattern a singleton design pattern is nothing but we won't let anybody create more than one instance of a class take a look at this class we cannot instantiate or create an object because we have only one constructor 
and that is private like we have like we've seen in our previous example but we're going to let access we're going to let the user access this method since this is public anybody would be able to access this method and what we're returning in this method is the instance of this class itself because we have access to this constructor within this class so we sort of created an instance using the new new keyword and we returned that object to whoever is calling and that's exactly what we're doing here let me uncomment these lines let's save the file I've created a couple of instances in fact I didn't create a couple of instances let me explain you what I mean in here I've requested for this instance as we discussed when we talked about the static keyword that all the static variables are associated with the class not with an object so regardless of how many objects we are creating we're ultimately pointing to the same field and that is associated with the class whatever we're returning in here object is of static you may want to revisit that video where we talked about the static keyword if this sounds confusing but in here we're sort of got the instance of that class the static instance I would say we have B we got the same instance if I update the value of X variable in here using the first instance then it's going to reflect in the second instance as well so in these two lines I'm printing the value of X using both the objects so even though I used the object a to set the value of X it will get reflected in here as well so the output of these two would be same let's try to run this program there you go now I'm using the terms object and instance they both essentially mean same we're going to create an instance of a class and we call it an object so don't get confused hope that's clear see you in my next chapter before we dive in and understand what is JPMS which is introduced in Java version 9 it might be worthwhile to understand some of the problems that were existing prior to Java 9 version and in this video specifically we're going to talk about the problem of jar hell jar hell refers to the problems arising due to the class loading mechanism Let's talk about a couple of such problems. The first one is the problem of forgotten dependencies. Imagine that you have a project and it depends on a bunch of other projects or libraries. And in turn, these libraries might be requiring a bunch of other libraries. Now, before the tools like Maven or Gradle, this is something that we have to do manually. I mean, developer would have to search on the internet for all these jar files, download them, make them part of the project, build the project and then deploy it onto the server. The problem here is, since this is done manually, there's a high chance that the developer might be missing some of the jars. And if that happens, whenever somebody were to use a feature of your application that might be requiring a class residing in one of these missing jars, then that would give us no class def found error and the application would crash. Another problem that might arise pertaining to jar hell is so-called shadowing shadowing might happen when you have two libraries having the same class with the exact same name again let's say that you have your project and you're using two versions of the same library inside the version 3.1 imagine that you have the class with name email manager and has the method send and inside the version 3.2 you have the exact same class with the exact same name but the method name is now changed to send email now the problem here is 
you can never predict which one of these classes would be picked up by the class loader. If the class loader happens to pick the one from the version 3.2 and inside your project you use the code email manager.send which actually belongs to version 3.1 your application would essentially break and would give us an error. Added to that if you happen to use one of the classes in version 3.1 the class loader would also load that class from version 3.1 meaning we're actually mixing these two libraries and using classes in both these libraries that might actually yield some inconsistent application behavior and this is something we definitely need to address. Now if you're familiar with tools like Maven and Gradle then you might have guessed it right they might actually solve majority of this problem but not completely it's still possible to reproduce these issues even with tools like Maven and Gradle. One of the problems that were existing before the Java 9 module system came into existence is the problem of public being too public. Let me explain you what I mean. Say that you have an application or a project called email app which is meant to be used to send emails. Just as with any other project even this would have multiple packages. Now let's say that the classes inside the utils package are only meant to be used within this project and not outside this project. Before Java 9 module system the only way you can accomplish this is by making all the classes inside the utils package as public. By doing so, those classes can be accessed outside the package where they are residing in. But the problem is, they are too public, meaning that some other project or an app can also access these files. For example, let's say that you have another project called Banking App and it wants to send emails to their customers or whatever. So obviously, they're going to use the email app library by importing it into their project. The problem here is, it can also access the utils classes which were originally meant to be used only within the email app project. So this is clearly a problem. What this means is, once after you deploy your application onto the remote server, the class loader would actually load all the classes in all the jar files and all the classes that were marked as public are visible to every other class. So that's definitely something that we need to work on. We can actually work around this issue by putting security checks and check to see if the call is coming from the right sources but it is not only inefficient but also takes a lot of effort to implement. One of the popular examples of this is the class unsafe of Java library. This class would allow us to manipulate with the memory and this is originally created to be used by the core Java files to implement core Java functionality but this class is also being used by a lot of other tools like Hadoop power mock etc. So definitely we need to address this. Modules will actually help us address this issue and we'll see how in coming lectures. One of the other concerns that the Java developers had back then before the module system came into existence is that the Java runtime being quite heavy. Well what do I mean by that? The Java platform consists of hundreds of packages but not all of them are actually essential to run your application. As an example, say that you're writing code for a device which doesn't have support for the GUI or the graphical user interface, then obviously it doesn't make sense to have those libraries to support graphical user interface. Or in other sense, let's say you're writing a hello world application, it doesn't make sense to have libraries like Swing UI or crypto libraries or XML parsers, etc. It's like you're going out to a shop to purchase something and then the shopkeeper tells you that you have to purchase everything in the shop because you never know what you might need in future. It doesn't make sense at all. If you unnecessarily bloat your environment with libraries that you don't need, then smaller devices like Raspberry Pis, mobile phones or TV setup boxes may not be able to support it. And even worse, if you're hosting your application on a cloud environment, and if you're using some containerization technology like Docker, then obviously this is going to incur some additional costs because the bigger the footprint, the higher are the costs. 
the rt.jar which is their runtime library had just a couple of hundred files during the initial releases of java but now this has become one big monolithic application consisting of thousands of files so what oracle has done for us is it has actually segregated this entire rt.jar in fact they've segregated the entire jdk into multiple concerns so that you can actually now create your own runtime with just the libraries that you'd be needing to run your application essentially this would bring down the size from few hundreds of mbs to just maybe 10 mb or so if this statement doesn't make sense then you'd have to hold on until we talk about the module system which is coming next so what exactly are java modules let us try to understand it with an example so going back to our previous example where the banking app is trying to send emails using the email app jar file and at the same time we don't want the banking app to access the public classes available under utils package of email app so with modules we can put that restriction so this time inside the email app we're going to introduce another file called module-info.java here we've given the name of the module as com.emailapp this is actually a recommended naming convention where you would give the same name as with the root package name and then inside which we're doing a bunch of exports we're exporting the email package we're exporting the operation package we're also exporting the connect package but we didn't export the utils package meaning that whoever wants to use the email app they can access all the public classes available in whatever the packages that were exported by the email app but they won't be able to access the packages that are not exported for example the utils package so by stating this the classes inside the utils class were only restricted within this module and not outside the module and inside the banking app you're going to have the same file module-info.java and it is also going to have a unique name in this case it's com.bankapp and then inside that we have mentioned what are all the modules it requires in this case we just define one module and that is com.emailapp because banking app wants to use that in order to send emails now guess what the banking app can actually import all the packages of email app that were exported by email app but it won't be able to access the utils package or its classes so what's the module here well just as you have packages to manage the visibility of classes and interfaces you have modules to manage the visibility of packages and their classes and believe it or not this is all it takes to get rid of all the problems we had talked previously if you want to understand how then you need to keep watching coming lectures all right to start off let us try to understand what are modules by exploring some of the existing modules in jdk in order to take a look at some of the existing modules we can type in the command java hyphen hyphen list hyphen modules so this has listed some of the existing modules the ones that are starting with java are the standard java modules and the ones that are starting with jdk are jdk specific modules and if you notice each one of these modules is ending with the version so what that means is this module right here belongs to this version of java we can actually take a look at the description of each one of these modules let's take a look at one of them maybe let's take a look at java.xml module so i would use the same command except i'm going to say describe module java.xml if you scroll a bit you notice that this module has exported bunch of packages which other modules can actually use and this module also requires other module called java.base the users directive states that this is trying to use a service and here are the list of services that it is using 
and we also have exports with two meaning that this package right here would only be exported to a specific module in this case it's crypto module we can do that as well we can actually take a look at all these inside the JDK directory as well let's get there so here it is we now have the jmods directory and you're going to see the exact same modules that we've seen on the command prompt we can actually take a look at what's inside it all you would see are a bunch of class files that are inside that module so essentially these are similar to jar files so here we have some class files I'm just trying to go random but it would have all the class files that belong to this module so earlier we had big monolith but with project jigsaw which was started back in 2008 they have segregated the entire JDK into multiple modules and so they have become more manageable pieces part of the reason how Oracle is able to release new features every once in a while every six months to be precise is because this modularization of the entire project has helped them develop and test in rapid manner I was also mentioning that we can actually create JRE environment for smaller devices without having all those libraries that we don't need to run our application well we have a tool specifically for that purpose we can create a runtime environment using a tool called jlink so if you get inside the bin directory and search for jlink so here you have that tool let's try to use it you can just run a command you're going to say jlink module path jmods if you remember that's the directory where our modules are residing and then you're going to specify the module or modules add modules in this case I'm just simply going to say java dot base module and we're going to output the JRE to a specific directory output I'm going to say e slash maybe new JRE slash JRE or whatever okay we got the typo error and this should create a runtime environment in this directory let's take a look if it did so here it is so down the line we're going to take a look at how to create our own modules so you can actually specify your own module in here and uh, jlink will actually create the runtime environment with all the libraries required to run just your application let's take a look at how modules would work with a quick example let's create a new java project by the way make sure that you have the latest version of eclipse i'm going to name this project as email app or whatever hit next or finish it has prompted me to enter the name of the module I can enter the name right now or I can do it later so I would choose the option don't create and we'll create it later 
So our project has been created. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to create a new package called com.emailapp.utils. Now this is the package which I don't want to expose to outside world. And then I'm going to create another package com dot email app dot email or whatever and this is something that we would like to expose inside this package I'm going to create a new class and that would have public static void main I'll just simply call it email sender hit finish let me also introduce a quick method public void send email and it's just simply going to have a sysout statement and we're going to have a similar class inside this package as well maybe I'll call it internal utils let's change the method name of this to something else some util whatever from util class save the file okay as of now we don't have the module info file so let's create one I'm going to right click on the project configure and here we have the option to create the module info.java file here we're asked to enter the name and as a good naming convention it better be the same name as with the root package which in this case is app, and it has already added those two packages by default let's get rid of the utils package because we don't want to expose it Let's create another Java project. Let's call it as banking app. And this time I'm going to create the module file. I'm going to name it as com dot banking app. Hit create. And inside the banking app module file, I'm going to specify the modules that I'm requiring. So I would say requires com dot email app. Okay, it has given us an error. Let's quickly fix it. We need to have this project in the build path. So you can right click on the project, go to properties, choose Java build, choose module path and click add you'd be able to find the email app module there but Eclipse has already done that for us let's create a new package with com.bankingapp hit finish and I'm going to create a new class file I'll call it as banking app or whatever it doesn't matter let's copy the public static void main method and inside here I'll try to access the email sender which was exposed by the email app sender equals new email sender I'll do Control Shift O to import that class and we don't have any error as such. We can call its public methods. Like for example, we have send email for instance. But if you try to access internal utils, you cannot do so because wouldn't export it it 
internal utils new internal utils i'll do control shift o and we have an error that says the type com.email app.utils is not accessible so that explains we cannot use it save the file and let's launch our application as the java application and we're able to see the message but the point here is we're able to export a package and all the classes in it are visible to other modules whereas the packages that we didn't export are not accessible so how did the module system help us get rid of the problems we had discussed earlier let's take a look we obviously got rid of the problem of public being too public because we're able to restrict the access to the public classes available inside the utils package by not exporting that package from the module where it is residing so this was addressed by the module system another problem that it had addressed is the problem of jar hell because of the fact that we can now define the list of modules that our project is dependent on java is aware of all the dependencies to run our project in case if there are any missing libraries or modules java would report an error during the compile time itself we don't have to wait until we deploy the application and then wait for somebody to use a feature that might be requiring a class file inside one of the missing jars just to see no class def found error another problem that it addresses is the problem of cyclic dependencies cycles would lead to inconsistent application behavior and might lead to some unforeseen exceptions or errors this happens primarily because you have two projects project a and b where a depends on b and b depends on a let me try to give you an example of one of the issues that might arise due to cyclic dependencies say that you have email app and the banking app from inside the email app you have a method that makes a call to a method inside the banking app and the exact same method would actually make a call back to the method of email app what happens is this goes on forever they just keep on calling each other forever and might lead to some kind of an exception like stack overflow error something of that sort the module system will not allow this to happen for example if you say email app requires bank app and vice versa bank app requires email app that's actually going to show you a compile time error that says cycle exists modules will not allow you to have cyclic dependencies with modules we can also get rid of the problem of shadowing where two classes might be having the exact same fully qualified name in modules you're not allowed to have two packages with the exact same name let me show you what i mean say that you have the projects banking app and the email app and let's say that they both have the exact same package name and then if you export the same package in both the modules then this is going to show us an error that says cannot export the package com.emailapp.email which belongs to the module com.emailapp if you have a third project which require either of these modules then you're going to see compile time error there as well if you cannot have two packages with the exact same name then there is no question of classes having the exact same fully qualified name i hope you enjoyed this tutorial please like and subscribe the link to the next part of this course is in the description below also if you want to learn java with practice with quizzes assignments scoring puzzles and interview questions i cannot do that on youtube so you need to take this course on my own website the link is again is in the description below i'll see you in the next part of this course